If you have a copy of the scriptures, let me invite you to turn over to the Gospel of Matthew once again and the 14th chapter, Matthew 14, as we're continuing this ongoing exposition through this first of the four canonical gospels uh, within our Bibles. And today we're going to be looking at Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21. Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21. Let me invite you as you're able, let's stand in honor of the reading and hearing of God's word. Matthew 14, beginning in verse 13, the apostle Matthew faithfully records. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men, beside women and children. May God bless today the reading and the hearing of his word. And let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thou hast uh, spoken to us in days of old through the prophets And in the fullness of time, thou didst send forth thy son, and thou didst provide through the apostles a faithful record of his words and his deeds. And now this is before us today. Christ is being presented before us today in the scriptures. We know that we need the illumination of the Holy Spirit so that we might be able to perceive that we would see clearly, hear rightly, This teaching of Christ. And so give us, O God, that light of the Spirit. So that by thy light, we might see light. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, we're continuing today our exposition of the Gospel of Matthew. And the events we're looking at here in the passage we just read come Just after, remember, Herod the Tetrarch had heard about the fame of Christ. And after Matthew had recorded for us what had happened to John the Baptist, how he had died as a martyr at the hands of Herod the Tetrarch. And you might remember in verse 12 of Matthew 14 how the disciples of John were told had come and they had shared this news with Christ. And this sets the scene for us for uh, this description, this inspired description of one of the most compelling miracles recorded in the Gospels. We call it the feeding of the 5,000, although it's made plain from verse 21 that there were in fact many more than 5,000 people who were present that day uh, who were fed. We've noted before in this series that of course that one of Christ's Prime areas of ministry was in working miracles. It says he went about preaching, teaching, and healing. And by healing, it's a reference to really all of his miracle working. 
I've said before that there are perhaps, if we look at the Gospels, four types or categories of miracles. First, there were healings. Christ healed the sick. He opened the eyes of the blind. He healed the lame. He cured those with leprosy. Also, another type of miracle is he cast out demons. He performed exorcisms. He had power over those who were evil spirits. Thirdly, and very rarely within the Gospels, there are accounts of Christ raising the dead. These aren't resurrections, but resuscitations. Uh, there are only, again, a couple of these. He raised uh, from death to life the, the daughter of Jairus, 12-year-old girl. Uh, he, he raised from life to death in Luke 7, the only son of a widow of Nain. And of course, in John 11, he raised his friend Lazarus uh, from death to life. But again, all those were resuscitations. They weren't resurrections. Those people were, were raised to life who had died and they would die again. And so uh, that, was, that was a miracle to show forth, I think, to anticipate the, the, the great miracle of the resurrection of Christ that was to come. The fourth kind of miracle that Christ performed, they're sometimes called nature miracles, where Christ showed or demonstrated his power over creation. One example of this is, is the first miracle, public miracle that Christ performed, recorded for us in John 2, of how he turned the water into wine. And when we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, the the eternal second person of the Godhead who took on flesh. Uh, the scriptures tell us that he was the one through whom all the worlds were made. In John 1.13 it says all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. The book of Hebrews begins in Hebrews uh, chapter 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And so it was through Christ, before the incarnation, the eternal second person of the Godhead, that the whole world was made. And now, as the eternal son of God become man, the word having taken on flesh, he shows in his ministry his mastery over the world that he made, over creation. And so this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, is an example of that. It's indeed one of the most cherished miracles that was ever performed by our Lord. Evidenced by the fact that apart from the resurrection, the miracle of miracles, this feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that appears in the record of all four of our Gospels. It's here as we're reading it today in Matthew 14. It's also in Mark 6, verses 30 through 44. In Luke 9, verses 10 through 17. In John 6, verses 1 through 13. Again, the only miracle that appears in the record of all four Gospels. This miracle, like all the Gospel miracles, was... A historical reality. It took place in space and time. This miracle, like all the miracles, demonstrates the power of Christ. It reminds us that with God, all things are possible. But the miracles, aside from simply sort of showing us the raw power of Christ and being simply recorded in the Gospels as historical accomplishments of Christ. They also, within the Gospel records, miracles often carry sort of a deeper spiritual significance. They often point us, nudge us toward spiritual truths. So in the healing miracles, when Christ opens the eyes of the blind, for example, often he's not just opening their physical eyes, but He's also opening often their spiritual eyes. And so the, the healings of the blind often remind us of the miracle of conversion. Because anyone who is regenerate, when we become Christians, we were blind, but now we see, right? Or the, the accounts of Christ's 
uh, healing those, say, with leprosy. Uh, he not only heals the, the leper, but we're reminded that he also cleanses men who are, who are diseased and, and sick with sin. And so the miracle accounts often have deeper spiritual levels. And so today I'm hoping by the end we can reflect upon what, 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 are, the, what are the spiritual meanings to be gleaned from this account of the feeding of the 5,000. And I want especially to, for us to meditate upon the command that Christ gives to the apostles. As he says to them in verse 16, give ye them to eat. Give ye them to eat. This is a pretty important command that Christ gave the apostles. It's recorded, in fact, also in Mark at Mark 637 and Luke at Luke 913. Exact same words in all three of those first three gospels. Give ye them to eat. And so in this account, we see the power of Christ. We're going to see the commissioning of the apostles. Give ye them to eat. And we're also going to see the saving and the sanctifying of sinners and the multitude who are the beneficiaries of this miracle. Well, before we get to that, let's work through the passage and let's see uh, if we can uh, learn from just working through the narrative. As we look at the passage, we can see that this inspired narrative might be divided into three parts. First of all, in verses 13 and 14, Christ goes to a desert place. Secondly, then in verses 15 through 18, Christ has a dialogue or conversation with the disciples about the care for the multitude, the feeding of the multitude. And then finally, in verses 19 through 21, Christ performs the miracle of the feeding of this multitude, including some 5,000 men. So let's walk through the passage together. Let's begin with that first part. Verses 13 through 14 sort of provides the setting, the transition in the narrative, telling us how Christ goes to a desert place. And so it begins in verse 13. When Jesus heard of it, uh, you see the of it is actually an italic. It's, it's simply when Jesus heard. Well, what did he hear about? What's being discussed here? Is it when he heard about the fact that Herod had heard of his fame? Of his miracle working power. And remember Herod had the Tetrarch had thought that, that Jesus was John the Baptist come back to life. Is it that? Or is it referring to the sort of retrospective description we're given in verses, verses 3 and following of chapter 14. Of how Herod had put John the Baptist unjustly to death. Because John had stood against his uh, illicit uh, and uh, sinful uh, marriage. To Herodias, and the result had been that his head was delivered uh, on a charger, on a platter, because of his stand for godliness. Was it, uh, remember at the end of, of uh, that account in verse 12, how the disciples of John went and told Jesus? Is it saying when he heard that? And perhaps those things had happened, you know, fairly close in time to one another. John had died at the hands of Herod, the disciples had reported this to the Lord Jesus. And also Herod then had heard of the fame of Christ. But what we're being told here in the opening of verse 13 is Christ is responding to the things that happened with Herod and with John the Baptist. And remember, all this is also coming on the heels of Christ's own rejection in his home country at Nazareth. Remember how Matthew 13 had ended. How Christ had gone into his home country and those in his home country had questioned, who is this man? Isn't this the carpenter's son? And he had said a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And remember how Luke gives us an even fuller description of that in Luke 4. How that on that occasion that they had taken Christ out to the brow of the hill, were ready to throw him over. And so there had been a threat upon his own life. There had been now the death of John the Baptist. And so now it, we're, we're seeing Christ respond to this. And what does he do? Look at verse 13. He departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. Now, uh, what did he do? He's, he's conducting his ministry in Galilee. That's where Herod the Tetrarch rules. Uh, 
Uh, the Sea of Galilee is there. He gets on a ship and he moves from one place to another and he goes to a deserted or an isolated place. In John's account, in John 6, 3, he says that Christ went up into a mountain and there he sat with his disciples. And by the way, we're going to be looking and being helped by listening to all the inspired accounts today as we listen to Matthew's account, but also Mark, Luke and John's. John also says that this took place when the Passover was nigh, as it says in John 6, 4. That he went to a desert place may indicate that he did so for reasons of security. After all, again, he had almost been um, thrown off a hill in Nazareth. John the Baptist had been put to death. And so perhaps he had gone to this place for reasons of security. He had told his apostles when he sent them out in Matthew 10, 16, that they were to be as wise as serpents. And as harmless as doves. And maybe he was practicing what he would preach to them. Going to this place to avoid conflict. And so perhaps he was seeking an out of the way place. To be out of Herod's grasp. It may be that he went to this desert place. Because he desired physical rest. True God and true man. Christ slept. Christ could become tired. It's not sinful to be tired. And perhaps... He knew that he and his disciples needed a place of physical rest, perhaps to escape the press of the multitude. Mark seems to indicate this in his account, where in Mark 6, 31, he records that Christ told the disciples at this point, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going and they had no leisure so much as to eat. There were so many people that they couldn't even stop to have anything to eat. Or it may indicate a desire for spiritual retreat. Maybe he went to the desert place to commune with the Father by the Spirit. This was often the practice of our Lord, providing a model for us, reminding us that we need times of rest, times of spiritual retreat, times of prayer. As it says in Luke 5, 16, and he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Whether for security, for physical rest or for spiritual rest, Christ and his disciples were not alone for long. So we read in the latter half of verse 13. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. So he goes to this desert place. They can't even get a bite to eat. And what happens? The multitudes of people are following them, swarming after the Lord Jesus Christ. This is indicative of his early ministry. People coming to him. He could heal people. You, you had someone who was sick. You were sick yourself. You wanted to come to this man who could do these mighty works. And so Christ is being thronged by the multitudes. It's at this point then that we have this telling description in verse 14 as we read, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. He went forth and saw this great multitude, even in this desert place. And what is Christ's reaction at this time? Did he say, Can't these people leave me alone? Can't these people see that I need a moment to myself? Why are they always bothering me? Is this what Christ says? No. Look at verse 14. As Matthew records. That when he saw the great multitude. He was what? Moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. He was moved with compassion for them. The word here for this Greek term, moved with compassion. It's literally the word that's used in Greek to refer to the entrails or the bowels, or we'd say the gut. He was inwardly moved. He was touched in the gut when he saw 
uh, this multitude and he had compassion. This is the second time in Matthew's gospel we've had a, such a description. If you look back in Matthew 9, verse 36, we see something very similar. It says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And again, right at the end, it says of Matthew 14, 14, and he healed their sick. Do you remember when we were in Matthew 12 and verse 15? It says, and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. And if you look ahead a little bit to Matthew 15 and verse 30, you'll read there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So we are seeing, just in these opening couple of verses, in this setting, in this narrative transition, we're seeing something about Christ. And what we're seeing about Christ are the vast depths of his compassion. We're seeing the vast depths of the compassion of our Savior. Never let it be said that the Lord Jesus Christ is aloof. Never let it be said that the Lord Jesus Christ is stingy with compassion. He is an ocean of compassion. We can't touch bottom of his compassion. Christ is a doctor, a, a spiritual physician who gladly works beyond the posted hours till every patient is treated and healed. I think when we were, when I preached on that similar statement in Matthew 9, I pointed out that that Christ never suffered Compassion fatigue. <laughs> we suffer that. Anybody in the helping professions, right? We suffer compassion fatigue. We get tired of meeting with people, talking with people, counseling people. But Christ never suffers compassion fatigue as he cares for the sick and the weary and the hungry who come to him. He never refuses to treat a patient who comes to him. His office is always open and he is always working. He is always working. Let's move to the second part of our passage. And this is Christ's dialogue with the disciples about the care for this multitude. This group that are like sheep without a shepherd that he has compassion upon. And we see this in verses 15 through 18. In this dialogue, we immediately meet with a contrast. And whereas Christ is this ocean of compassion, uh, the disciples are less so. And so in verse 15, it says, And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away. So it is uh, getting to be in, in the evening, the end of the day. It's time to clock out. Uh, darkness would soon come. This meant pitch darkness in the wilderness in his time before electricity. This was a desert place. There were no nearby towns and markets where available food might be bought. And so we might, in defense of the, the disciples... We might say, well, maybe we shouldn't blame them here. They're being pragmatic. Maybe they're thinking about the best interests of the multitude. They don't want to see them go hungry. And so they, they're suggesting that they be sent away now so that they might go to the villages and buy themselves victuals or food, as it says in the end of verse 15. Uh, so perhaps there can be something positive that's being said about them. In John's account... Uh, he says that at this point, Christ has an interaction with one of the disciples. And John very interestingly mentions some of the disciples by name with whom Christ spoke. And Christ was speaking with Philip. And it says in John 6, 5 and following, 
When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? How are we going to feed these people? And then John tells us that Christ said this to prove him. For he himself knew what he would do. And then in John 6, 7, Philip answers and says, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. And what the AV renders in John 6, 7 is 200 penny worth of bread. In the original Greek is 200 denarius. And a denarius was typically one day's wages. So 200 days wages, that's a lot actually of money. And, and so Philip had said, even if we had, you know, 200 days wages for an average person, this wouldn't be enough to feed this vast multitude. Mark also records that the disciples had said unto Christ in Mark 6, 37, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth or 200 denarius of bread? And give them to eat? Like, that's crazy. We can't do that. At the beginning of verse 16, however, Christ responds. And notice the first thing that he says. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. They need not depart. They do not need to leave. Again, John gave us the insight that Christ knew what he would do. And the disciples at this point were only thinking, were they not, of naturalistic prospects for solving this problem. They were only thinking of ordinary prospects for solving this problem. They were not thinking about extraordinary or super naturalistic prospects for meeting this problem. And this is interesting because this is despite the fact that they've been with Christ. They've seen the things that he does. They've seen him in this immediate context healing the sick. All the power of Christ seems to have been forgotten or overlooked in the face of this present crisis. And of course, when we read through the Gospels, we should never read them trying to identify with Christ. We're not Christ. Most often when we read through the Gospels, who should we identify with? The disciples, usually. And we're just like them. We know what Christ has done. We've seen his mighty works, but we meet the present crisis in our lives. And it's like all that memory of what he has done is out the window. We think, I've got to solve this in my own power, in my own strength. And I've got to look at my resources to be able to take care of this. Neglecting... Uh, the power of Christ. The second thing that he says in verse 16 to them is this command that I want to give some special attention to today. Give ye them to eat. In other words, he says to the apostles, you feed them. Give ye them to eat. Matthew's telling of this account, the feeding of the 5,000, is actually pretty streamlined, condensed. It's a lot longer in Mark's account, in John's account as well. And so we simply have this command, give ye them to eat. And then we're told in verse 17 that the apostles respond and they say to him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. I said this, this feeding of the 5,000, this miracle is the only one that appears in all four of the Gospels. And in all four of the Gospel accounts, they all agree in the details here that this is the total sum or this was the total sum of all the resources they had at hand. Five loaves and two fishes. And so we can see the same in Mark 6, 38, Luke 9, 13, John 6, 9. In John's account, he tells us that Andrew, Peter's brother, was one of those who announced this to Christ. And John is the only one that tells us where the five loaves and the two fishes came from, that there was a, a lad there. And he seemed to be the only one who had any food with him of the multitude that was there. So in John 6, 8, 
We read and following one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brothers, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? John provides us in his account, again, this added detail, telling us that it was the lad who had the five loaves and the two fish. We're also told that the five loaves were barley loaves and that the two fishes were two small fishes. I imagine two sardines. And John also tells us Andrew's question. But what are they among so many? By the way, there have been some really horrible, wretched, moralistic interpretations of this miracle based on the mention of this lad. A few years back, I saw a Sunday school lesson from a denominational press on the feeding of the 5,000 on this miracle. And they tried to make the point of it to be that we ought to all be like that little lad. We may not have very much to give, but... If we would just give what we have, then God will do great things with it. It's kind of like a stewardship sermon. I wonder how many stewardship sermons have been preached on the account in John 6. It made the account, again, a moralistic lesson telling us that it's all about the generosity of the lad. Well, this story is not about the generosity of the lad. It's about the power of Christ. If you make it about the generosity of the lad, a moralistic lesson, it misses the point. The point is that humanly speaking, they had next to nothing, if not nothing at all, in comparison to the great gaping need. But Christ is here. It's not about generosity of the lad, but it's about the greatness of Christ. A line in the old hymn, Rock of Ages, reads, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And so, though, what are these things among so many? We have Christ saying in verse 18, Bring them hither to me. Bring them hither to me. The gifts The collection is paltry, nothing really in light of the need, but still Christ commands that they be brought to him. Small resources are indeed great when placed in Christ's hands. And this leads us then to the last part of the passage, verses 19 through 21, where we have the inspired account of Christ's miraculous feeding of the multitude. Now, Christ himself acts with authority. He acts as a commander, as a spiritual general. It says in verse 19, And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Let's meditate on some of this. Again, he acts as a commander. He commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. Mark, in his account, adds further detail. In Mark 6, 39 and 40, he says, And he commanded them to make make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. Mark's the only one that calls it the green grass. And Mark says, Mark 6, 40, And they sat down in ranks by hundreds And by fifties. On our Wednesday evening study, we've been going through 1 Corinthians and here recently, 1 Corinthians 14. And one of the things that that comes through is, is the desire for orderliness in the worship of the church. And here's an interesting emphasis on orderliness. This isn't a free for all. Christ is commanding. He's putting them into companies by hundreds and by fifties. And we're seeing in Christ's own ministry an emphasis on orderliness. There is then something of a sort of a sacramental nature in the description of this miraculous meal. And if you're familiar with the accounts of Christ's institution of the Lord's Supper, there's there's some things that will sound very similar 
And indeed, it's anticipating that. It's not about that, but it's anticipating that in some way. Christ takes the humble elements, the loaves and the fishes. He looks up into heaven. This is Christ at prayer, the posture of prayer. The Son of God as a man is on the earth in communion or fellowship with the Father in heaven. And we're seeing again Christ as the consummate man of prayer. He taught his disciples how to pray. In the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13, we saw an example of his spontaneous prayer life when we were back in Matthew 11. And there's a record there in verse 25 and following of Christ's spontaneous prayer life as he says, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. And here's another example of the spontaneous prayer life of Christ. Here also he prays in a most natural manner. And having done so, he blessed the elements. He broke them and gave them to the disciples who in turn gave them to the multitude. Notice the orderliness he gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. The description here again is historical, but it's also intentional. What it reveals to us is that Christ is the source of power and the disciples are what they do. They make the, the loaves multiply. No, they're simply the means of relaying the power. And then the multitude, they are the recipients of the power. Christ is the source. The disciples are the means. And the multitude are the recipients. How did this miracle take place? It's really interesting to look at the history of the interpretation of the Bible. Um, there was a time back in the, in the 1700s and so forth. There was a movement that was called the Enlightenment a friend of mine calls it the endarkment. And there was an emphasis on we have to have a rational interpretation for everything. People in that era said, couldn't really accept the concept of miracles. They said everything has to be interpreted in what they called, uh, according to a uniformitarian principle. Everything happens uniformly in life. If we don't expect that we can sit down right now and, and multiply loaves and fishes, then we shouldn't expect that it happened in the past. And it's really curious to read some of the people who tried to interpret this using pure rationalism and cutting out all the miraculous and all the supernatural. You know what their explanation of this was? They said this was a miracle of generosity. <laughs> See, the people actually had food, but they had hidden away from themselves. But when they saw the generosity of the lad, then they all, well, I've got some food. I'll share mine too. And it was a, a miracle of generosity. Well, that's balderdash, isn't it? Isn't it? That's more far-fetched to conceive than it being what it is. A miraculous work of God. There's no explanation like that in the text. This cannot be explained as something ordinary. This was a work of God on earth. The God who made the world in six days and all very good out of nothing, ex nihilo, made five loaves and two fish enough to feed thousands. If you can just get past Genesis 1, you've got no problem believing all the miracles in the Bible. There's a God who makes the world in the space of six days and all very good, he can do as he pleases among the inhabitants of the earth. <clears throat> and so he, he, he's the source, the disciples are the means, the, the multitude of the recipients. And then we read in verse 20, and they did all eat and were filled. This is another facet of the miracle. Not just that they were fed, but they were filled. They were satisfied. And what is more, we're told in verse 20, and they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. 
How many apostles were there? There were 12. Well, every one of them got to carry back a proof in his hands of the power of Christ. He not only gave them all that they need to eat so they were filled, but he gave because he's God and can do it. He gave them even more. So David in the shepherd's psalm in Psalm 23, 5 says, my cup runneth over. So the apostle Paul prays in Ephesians 3, 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And then Matthew adds to top it all off. Adding to the astonishment factor even further, this note in verse 21, that those who had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. It's interesting, if you look at Mark's account in Mark 5, 44, he simply says that the number who did eat were about 5,000 men. But again, Matthew adds that there were also women and children there. This means there may have been as many as 10 to 15,000 people who were fed that day with five loaves and two fishes. And what's really amazing is that, you know, ancient cities weren't that big. The, 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 the 15,000 people there assembled probably made it maybe the largest city in Judea. Uh, it, it, it's a huge number of people. It's, it's it, again... If it's not, if, if the gospel writers are fabricating a story, they wouldn't have made it this fantastic. It's incredible. 15,000 people fed with five loaves and two fish. It's amazing. It shows the power of Christ. And so, friends, we've worked through the account. Let us now turn and see if we can think of and tease out some of the spiritual applications. And no doubt you've already done so yourself with the help of the Spirit. Again, this report, record of this miracle, like all the other reports of miracles described in the Gospels, is a historical reality. It is really happened. It truly happened just as Matthew tells us. But it also bears witness to underlying spiritual truth. And we can focus, I think, to, to learn about this truth, we can focus upon three figures within this account. First of all, it tells us about the one who performed the miracle. It tells us about the person and work of Christ. Secondly, it tells us about the ones through whom Christ worked, the apostles. And beyond the apostles, the church today. And thirdly, it tells us about the multitude, those who were the recipients, those who were the beneficiaries of the power of Christ, those who were fed through the means of the disciples. And so let's look at those three figures. First of all, what do we learn in this account about the person and the work of Christ? The purpose of this miracle account, as recorded here in the scriptures, as with all the miracle accounts, is to make us stand in awe at the power and authority of Christ. We are meant to conclude, as we question ourselves, who has power over nature to do such things? Who has power over creation to be able to multiply loaves and fishes? Who can do such things but God himself? Christ did these things. And so what is the conclusion? Jesus is Lord. Again, John tells us that when the Lord did this miracle, the Passover was nigh, according to John 6, 4. What happened at the Passover? The Jews remembered their deliverance from bondage in Egypt. When the Lord had led his people out, and what had he done? He had fed them in the wilderness. John adds, after he gives the account of this miracle, 
in John 6, 1 through 13. He adds in John 6, 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. The feeding of the 5,000 was a proof that Christ was the prophet that Moses had written about in Deuteronomy 18. The prophet who would come. The prophet, priest, and king. In John's account, John tells us that after Christ did this miracle, that he told the people in John 6, 32, that he was the true bread from heaven. The true manna come down from heaven. And in John 6, 35, Christ on this occasion had uttered the first of what we call the seven I am sayings of Christ. In John 6, 35, as he said to the people, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And so what do we learn in this passage about Christ? He has power. He is God. He is Lord. He is the bread of life. He is the food that we need. He is our necessary food. Man doesn't live by ordinary bread alone. He lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We only really live if we're feeding upon Christ. Secondly, it tells us about the apostles. And beyond them, the church today. What does Christ say to the apostles? Give ye them to eat. Give ye them to eat. Again, it's not a throwaway statement. It has significance. It's recorded here. In some ways, that statement is anticipating the commission that Christ is going to give the apostles. In John 21, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, he appears to seven of his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. One of them is Peter. Peter, who had denied Christ three times. And Christ has a personal conference with Peter. The man who denied him three times. And three times he asked Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? And each time Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then three times Christ recommissions Peter. And what does he say to him? In John 21, 15, he says, feed my lambs. In John 21, 16, then he says, feed my sheep. And finally, in John 21, 17, he says again, feed my sheep. In other words, Give ye them to eat. At the end of the gospel of Matthew, the risen Christ will say to these same apostles in the passage we know as the, the so-called great commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, what? Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you even to the end of the world. When he said, go and teach all nations, what was he saying? Give ye them to eat. Tell them about me. The commission given to the apostles continues in the church today, which is built on the foundation of the prophets and apostles with Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And so Christ says to us today, as he said to the apostles of old, give ye them to eat. There is indeed significance here in the fact that the disciples had so little, humanly speaking, to offer. Spurgeon says, it is good for us to know how very poor we are and how far from being able to meet the wants of the people around us. Indeed, we can't. Humanly speaking, we have nothing to offer. Nothing in our hands we bring. Simply to thy cross we cling. Truly though, our very little goes a long way in Christ's hands. This is a reminder that we, following after the apostles in the church, built upon them, on Christ himself as a chief cornerstone, we have but one thing to give the world, and that is Christ. So Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and following, but we preach Christ crucified, 
unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Give ye them to eat. Third, this passage tells us about the multitude who were fed by Christ. As Christians, we can relate to the apostles. But more foundationally, we can relate to the hungry, to the sick, and to the bewildered multitude. We are reminded, who are Christians, that when we were in our unregenerate state, Christ did not look upon us with indifference. He did not look upon us with disdain. He did not say, I don't have time to you. Can't you get it together? Can't you do anything right? But instead, he looked upon us with compassion. He saw us as sheep without a shepherd. He healed us. And he fed us. And he's still feeding us. And verse 20 in this passage describes the experience of all those who have found faith in Christ. And they did all eat and were filled. Christ is the only one who could fill and satisfy our hungry souls. And for those who are here today who are not yet in the company of the saints, I was speaking of the experience of Christians. What you need to hear today is that Christ doesn't look upon you indifferently or with disdain. He looks upon you with compassion. And he can fill and satisfy your hungry soul. He's the only one who can. The deepest needs of men, our deepest needs and desires will not be satisfied when the church today offers us politics or yoga classes or financial counseling. But the deepest needs of men will only be met when we offer the only thing that matters and the only thing that satisfies Christ himself so when Christ says to us give ye them to eat let us give them Christ amen we invite you to stand together let's join in prayer gracious and loving God we do give thee thanks for this precious record of this miracle that Christ performed. And we do believe because the scriptures are infallible, that they are without fault, without error, that this is a completely accurate account of what transpired. But we also know that there is a spiritual lesson, spiritual lessons also to be conveyed to us. Help us to know better the power of Christ to know better as Christians the commission that has been given to us and to know better as the multitude uh, how we might be satisfied in Christ, how we might be healed, how we might be fed. And so help us to, to, to grow today, even by virtue of being here in our admiration, our love for Christ and our desire for him. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.